Okay. Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Stacey Storino. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. This is the number one place for the more mature entrepreneur who has a pre-existing business and is doing some to all of their content marketing on their own, who wants to learn more about how to drive traffic to their business so they can do more business, right? So today's topic is going to be about like what suggestions and recommendations I have from 20 years over 20 years of being an entrepreneur myself uh, and being a coach for about eight years, uh, a content marketing coach for about eight years, what kind of tips, tricks, techniques, and thought processes I do think that you should go through <clears throat> because, you know, when challenging times come economically or there's a war time that may or may not, you know, directly to once or twice removed indirectly affect your business, it's super important for you to be able to know what to do so that you don't lose the business that you built up and that your business doesn't get <clears throat> any shorter or any more challenging than it needs to be under the facts and circumstances. So I have over two decades of experience in the trenches as an entrepreneur. I've seen economic crashes and all sorts of things. And on the flip side, I've been a content marketing coach, and as many of my students will tell you, because I have thousands of them across the world, um, <clears throat> they will tell you that when a lot of people thought that they should quit or they should give up or that it was rude and crude to market their business over the course of the pandemic, <clears throat> a lot of people went to multiple five and six figures in a year more than they ever thought they could do, more than they've ever seen. And some of my students were in business for years before they got to me. So I believe me, I saved a, helped to save a lot of businesses that would have just collapsed and run away because challenging times hit, bad economic times hit, you know, an unprecedented pandemic. And now we've got a war going on and who knows how big it could possibly get. And who knows, obviously, past a certain point, one of my students gave me this because I always said I don't have a crystal ball. And they're like, now you do. But this thing doesn't work, right? Like, I don't know. I can't tell you with specificity just how bad everything's going to get and for just how long. But like <clears throat> students <laughs> who are seeing this live and on the replay, comment down below your recollections. Those of you who were with me in, say, 2019 going into 20. Um, you know, how many people were like, oh my God, how long is this going to last? And we don't know what's going to happen. And 20 million Americans lost their jobs, at least temporarily, and all these things. And as some of you may know, we went through and analyzed what happened during the Great Depression. We'll touch on some of that here today. If you have any straight up content marketing questions, you can put that in there. I'm here on my channel, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, once a week on Wednesdays. And then I have pre-edited content that comes up here all the time, neatly organized into playlists. You want to learn about TikTok content marketing. Um, one of my students went to over 820,000 on TikTok alone. Um, I've got playlists for that. I've got playlists for Instagram with and without reels-based content marketing. I have an Instagram SEO um, playlist. Like if you're new around here, you should subscribe because, you know, there's a ton of people doing click by click content marketing type videos. And those are really good. There's a bunch of people who will talk about algorithmic updates. And I'll do that, too, from time to time on Instagram or what have you. But when it comes to subjective content marketing and trying to optimize your business in the background while you're a solopreneur or a small business, especially wearing all or most of the hats, <clears throat> what you do when there's challenging times and how you do your content marketing in a tasteful way. Uh, we've lived through this, the students who are with me 2019 and 20, we've lived through this before. Um, I will have some of the same advice. And then when it comes to wartime and how it may or may not affect supply chains, <laughs> Forget supply chain issues you've seen before. There's a possibility of over the next weeks to months seeing a big supply chain issue go down, depending upon where you are in the world and how that affects you, how that's going to affect what if you're a product based business, whether you're handmade or not, how that's going to be able to affect your ability to do business going forward. <clears throat> 
Is it tasteful to market during challenging times and so on and so forth? So some of this stuff, if you're a longtime student of mine, you've heard before, but not all of it. I pulled up a very interesting article. Uh, I have to give credit to it. Mental Floss is the website. And these are five great depression success stories. I'm not going to read the whole article, but if you want to Google it and see some of the fine points, I'll highlight what I think <clears throat> going forward. If you're just projecting and like doing damage control on behalf of your business, no matter what kind of business model you have, <clears throat> I want to give you some advice that I think will help you because right now we're in like the brainstorming session. I don't think depending upon where you live in the world. Obviously, we pray for those that are in Ukraine. Um, but if you're not in the Ukraine, if you're not over on that side of the world, you're not necessarily going to see anything too, too extreme for like a little bit. So you've got some time to put yourself in pole position so that especially if you're a product-based business, you can continue to run. <clears throat> If you're a coach, a course creator, you provide services, especially if you do all or most of your work digitally, you're obviously, you know, painting with a broad brush. You're obviously in a bit of a better position. And some of my students are here now. So let me greet them. And then we're going to get into the guts of the um, of my little presentation here. Heather DuPay is here. Heidi Mine is here. Hi, Miss Heidi. How's everything going? Uh, Susie B is here from the Speckled Loon by Susie B. Everybody's favorite farmer and blacksmith is here, Mike Reinhard. Hi, Mike. What's going on? How's the bull cam doing with the GoPro? That is, <clears throat> he posted in my group, Content Marketing for Conversions, which is a free Facebook group. You're welcome to join. There's two freebies there in the files section when you join. People find both of those very, very useful. So if you're on Facebook, you're Facebook friendly, go to Facebook. Search up content marketing for conversions. Apply to get in. I'll just make sure you're not a bot. And in you go. Um, but Mike posted in that group um, a couple days ago. He bought a GoPro and he put it on his bull to do like a bull cam. And people love it. So, <laughs> And we enjoyed it in the group. So, Mike, I think you're sitting pretty. I'll get to you in a little bit. So make sure you hang out or catch the replay. Because people like Mike, at least for now, I think is kind of in a sweet spot, even if things come crashing down. Depending upon your business and how you go about it, you could come out of this thing really fine, even if it, God forbid, becomes like a bigger war, a bigger issue. It affects supply chain issues more and more extensively, right? We're going to talk about this. So let me just finish greeting my students who are here now. If you're here on the replay, whether you're a student of mine or not, please put hashtag replay. And if you've got any questions about what we talk about today or any content marketing questions in general, even on the replay, please put that down below um, and I will get to you. Um, so Lisa Garrett's here. Brookfield Candle Company's here. What's up, Miss Lenora Love? Lenora, did you start your, um, your um, YouTube orbit yet? That's a big undertaking, girl. Denise at Devonche Creations is here. What's going on, Miss Denise? What's going on? Hashtag live, almost forgot. Yes, yeah, students, hashtag live, hashtag replay. Thank you, Lenore, Denise. Uh, Lisa Garrett's usually really good. Oh, there she is. Hashtag live and hashtag replay. Good morning, Miss Lisa. I'm Chicken Swell is here. Hi, Stacey. Hi, I'm Chicken Swell. What's going on? All right, so let's see. Oh, and Mail Lori S. Hi, good morning. Glad to make it live. I'm glad that you were able to make it live too. Mallory S. Mallory, Mallory, yes. Lenore says, you know, I am finishing up a month of subject and notes for each. That's, it's good to be as prepared as possible when you do an annual orbit. Um, so Renee Christine, who is one of my friends and was a coach of mine um, back in like 2016, she talks about at least every so often, like if you really want to liven up your um, YouTube channel, especially that you go through a year's worth of of daily videos onto that YouTube channel. It's a big undertaking. If you know your ideal uh, customer or audience and you optimize your titles, thumbnails, and um, tags really well per video, it's worthwhile work and your channel really should grow. So that's really important. Lenore and anybody like Lenore, you guys know I am not about random acts of content. When you publish content, to any platform, there has to be a call to action. 
you're not a regular influencer. You're not doing this for personal fun, although you may have personal fun doing this. Any content you put, whether it's in a 365 day orbit or not, make sure that you're driving traffic to an email list, please. Um, or if you're running a sale like I am right now. <laughs> so pin to the first uh, comment down below. Let people know about a sale. If you're not running a sale, if there's nothing promotional going on, then you need to build up your email list because as many of my students know, statistically speaking, roughly three quarters of your income will actually come from your email list and about a quarter from like your website, no matter how googly SEO friendly optimized it is and from your social media content. Okay, so your email list, you will drive them more effectively to any sales pages or your website in general, if you're having a site-wide sale, that sort of thing. Um, ooh, wait, Mike gave me, so yes, you want to plan this stuff out in advance. Mallory, <laughs> I'm glad I got it right. Um, yes, you want to plan the stuff out in advance, but you always need a CTA or call to action or you may be wasting your time. Please make sure that you're telling somebody to click the link in bio, like on TikTok or Instagram. Please make sure that on Facebook, Facebook is great in that you can drop links anywhere. <laughs> drop a link to something. Um, uh, you know, make sure you're building up that email list if you're not driving people to a sale. So pinned on the first comment during the live, and I will put it in the first line of the description on the replay, my Mint Batch of Frosting or my March Relationship Marketing and Sales Plan mini course is currently available, um, eight lessons. You get a Facebook group with a ton of live stream teachings that I did all the replays from them, including the ones that I did during the pandemic when everybody started to like freak out and go, should I just not do my business? You know, um, what can I do? No one's going to buy 20 million Americans alone lost their jobs you know, no one's going to buy. It's like the Great Depression. And no, it's not like the Great Depression because telework or working from home was building steadily in the U.S. from 1995 onward, right? So there were a lot of people who didn't lose their jobs at all. In fact, most people didn't lose their jobs or their income or anything. We were at 330 million back then. So 310 million people had the money they had, had the budgets they had, and had the disposable income that they had. I hate to sound really mean-spirited, but like you will make more money when everybody who has money, at least upper middle class and above or middle class and we're not living paycheck to paycheck, they've got money to spend. And if they are laying low, they're laying at home, you know, um, they're going to go shopping. And now like, more than 75% of all um, customers that you could have, no matter what your business model, they're really electronic e-commerce first. So um, Mike Reinhardt said, oh, the GoPro on the bull is going well. One video is over 200,000 views. Definitely something to build on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Animal lovers galore, people who are homesteading, people who love to see like, you know, livestock and stuff like that. They're going to just like be macking on those bulls. They're going to love them so much. So definitely continue to do that. Um, just make sure that there's some sort of call to action in any future posts that you do, Mike. You want to get people onto your email list. You could ship fresh produce to them in the continental U.S., right? Or if you can do metal work for them and ship finished pieces, you want to be able to do that. Uh, I'm Chicken Swell said, wow, Mike. Yeah. That's on TikTok, right, Mike? So um, I have plenty of content about TikTok on my channel. And once I'm done with my coach course creator series, I think I have a couple more videos for that. Like, so maybe another week's worth of content on that. Um, you know, I'll be going into TikTok and Reels marketing, uh, updated strategies, techniques, algorithm updates, what I'm going to do to build my account. Um, Cause I'm the shoemaker who has no shoes. Joe's dairy barn grill. Is it over 820,000 people on TikTok? And I'm like 136. So <laughs> maybe I should be building up my own account for a little bit. You think? Cause they're, they've kind of got it on autopilot over there now. Um, so let's talk about, so again, check out the mint batch of frosting. If you don't have that, um, I have a batch of frosting for every single month out of the 12 months in a year. Um, so mints for March. And this is content marketing that's both relationship marketing based and sales based content marketing. 
how to do it, St. Patrick's Day aside, so that you can build up your email list, you can build up your brand-based community, and of course, you can build up your sales. So give that a look-see. All right, let's get into the content. So again, this article comes from Mental Floss. It's five great depression success stories. Because uh, back then, they we did not have the computers, and we did not have the ability to work from home, and you know all of that. So when people lost their jobs back then, um, it was more cataclysmic, right? So don't mean to sound cold. I'm not going to read the whole article, but I am going to cite to a couple of things that I think you guys can take no matter what your business model, no matter what you're selling and no matter who you're selling it to. I do think these tips will help you. Um, <clears throat> and then for my handmade and product based people, I'm going to throw some extra stuff in at the end. Um, but this is, everybody should consider this. Okay, so with the pandemic, we all know that the movie theaters, they suffered because, you know, until they got a little bit more quick on the uptake with the direct-to-consumer stuff, um, you know, it was hard for, you know, the owners of the movies, the producers of the movies to make money and the theaters themselves suffered. It wasn't because most of America lacked money. Most of the Amer most of the Amer that, that. Out of 330 million Americans, okay, 20 million lost their jobs. If 310 million didn't, their lives technically didn't change. They could have gone to the movies. They just, we had lockdowns and or they were afraid to after the lockdowns were over. So, you know, but back in the Great Depression, it was more about not having money. It wasn't about the lack of physical capacity to go. So the movie theater industry, um, the beginning of the Great Depression in 1929, it really clobbered them for several years to come. However, however, um, you know, while early in the economic crisis, a lot of movie houses did close their doors because they just they couldn't like turn on the dime and pivot with the times and the challenges. Um, some studios did not go under, though. And what they did. Right. If you're not a brick and mortar, if you're not dependent on people coming to you. Um, that's okay. I do have some students who have brick and mortars and they have e-commerce going on, but still listen to this because it's going to help you pivot in your head. Um, you know, it will make you think more creatively. Um, so there was a really bad market, but those that remained in the film industry got creative. So they did cut ticket prices. I don't recommend that you do that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> Um, but back then it was more of a financial crisis as opposed to like, um, for the movie theaters anyway, a supply chain crisis, right? So they cut their ticket prices, but that's not what I recommend you do. Um, but they also got creative about getting people to come in the door, whether they cut their ticket prices or not. Uh, for one thing, they did double features. So they gave you more for either the same amount of money or for those that cut they gave you more for less. They had double features. Smaller studios definitely, um, you know, stayed afloat because they did that. Um, they also uh, did giveaways to fill seats. So they had promotions like Dish Night. So back in, in the day when women were really predominantly homemakers, you know, any homemaker who attended a movie um, and paid full price, they got a free dinner plate. Ooh, you say, I'm going to tell you how it's going to help you in a minute. That kind of idea, that kind of pivot. Um, but again, don't cut your prices. If anything, you probably have to raise your prices because of inflation in the US, maybe in other countries, because I do have a global audience, the cost of goods are going up. So um, make sure that you're protecting your profit margins under every last circumstance. The only exception to that rule is if you have a clearance sale. Like if you're a physical products based business handmade or not, a clearance sale, like definitely run that. Um, you know, get turn a buck, turn your products into cash, you know, try to recapture the money that you invested plus at least some profit margin and get stuff out the door. But these theaters, they did cash door prizes, they did silverware giveaways. Um you know, each trip to see a movie, you could end up getting a whole set of flatware over time. <laughs> um, so even though box office takes did drop, not everyone had to go out of business. And it wasn't just the little local places um, that might have gotten away with just a double feature. Um, what is a takeaway for you guys is like whether you're a coach, course creator, your digital products only 
your services only or your product space, don't cut your prices. Again, look at your profit margins, look at the cost of any of your overhead, and you probably do have to raise prices. Everyone's raising prices. It's going to be a rare person who's going to be all shocked that you have to raise your prices. So to the extent that you need to do that, it kind of keeps slipping between the cracks. Protect your profit margin or that's going to be one of the fastest ways, whether it's good financial times or not, or whether it's wartime or not, to go out of business. So we don't want that. But I want you to think about what you could throw in either double feature style if things get really bad. Like right now, do I think you have to do these things? Not necessarily. In the coming weeks, if things get ridiculous and there's more of an extreme global impact and God help us all more global involvement, and you're like, oh my God, the sky's falling. Then, but I want you to work on your pricing and your profit margins And I want you to kind of have like an an emergency break glass kind of marketing, you know, and sales um, plan going, right? Like the mint batch of frosting will help you on an evergreen basis for the month of March with marketing and sales plans for pretty much no matter who your ideal customer is, um, it's like where the average person's head is going to be at in the month of March and how you can tailor make your offerings and your sales to kind of meet them where they are so that your offerings make more sense for them to take you up on it in the month of March, right? But like here, I want you to think on your own, but using today's teachings to help you, like what can you do to prepare just in case there is an emergency and you have to break glass? And if reducing your prices isn't in the cards and it's not, like what kind of double feature, like what kind of double benefit can you give somebody? Like in terms of services, like what what can you do to expand your service package for the same price where it's not going to hurt your profit margins. If you are a coach or a course creator, maybe there's another bonus that you throw on to the package. Um, You know, I don't want to get into this too much here, but like it's offer stacking. What do you do as a coach, course creator, or digital, you know, assets only kind of business model? If that's your business model, What do you stack on so that you can keep the same price? You're protecting your profit margins. But for those who can afford to do it, and with a lot of telework, that's going to be a bunch of people no matter what across the globe. What can you do to make your offer even more enticing during a challenging time so that for somebody who can afford it, they're going to pull the trigger, right? For my product space people, I want you guys to like not just go through and raise your prices and protect your profit margins because you've got inflation and supply chain issues to lean on as an an excuse, literally or figuratively, but I want you to literally, and I know some of my students have laughed at this, I'm like, do a major primal, you know, screen clean, cleaning of your home, your office, your work area, whatever, go through your whole house And any products that you made even years ago that like, you're like, I've pivoted. It's not a direct fit. I don't know what I'm going to do with it all, but I don't want to throw it out. Now would be a perfect time for your in emergency break glass for you to know how much stuff you've already made. The money's already spent. What can you kind of like put in a basket or a package where you're still protecting your profit margins, but you can at least kind of do your own double feature with tangible physical products, stuff that you already have. What's collecting dust in the attic? What's shoved in a box under your bed? What can you get out of your already super Nova packed, you know, office or workspace where you're like, I'm going to declare defeat. And instead of running a clearance sale, maybe it makes more sense given my current facts and circumstances that I just kind of create my own product space double feature. It's two for one or for every order over whatever, I'll throw in a whatnot, right? I'll throw in a widget. Does that make sense? So Mike says, yes, on TikTok, a lot of folks, because he had the 200,000 view video, a lot of folks don't know uh, (laughs) they're not normal size cows. They're miniature white Dexter bulls that are less than 2,000 registered animals in the USA. Oh my goodness, Amy Lindblade's here, everybody. Amy Lindblade, what's going on? Okay, so I love that, Mike. And you can create additional, like, quick, like, 
seven, 10, 15 second videos that kind of give people some tips or um, some um, some trivia about these bulls because you're creating a brand-based community. If they're really loving the animals, give them more details about the animals. They're going to like it. And it's easier for you to create content on TikTok. Um, without getting too derailed about TikTok, I will tell you, um, for Joe's Dairy Bar and Grill, it's hard. We're like a $1.3 million business a year in climbing. So it's hard for us to keep up with daily videos. So, but we try to do it as much as we can. Um, it, with TikTok, that's one of those platforms that you really need to post. You know, if you're posting like scattershot, you're not going to get all the results that you could get um, because one of the things that the TikTok algorithm definitely rewards is frequency. So um, any excuse to create even a 10 second video plus or minus a little, you're going to be good, Mike. And longer isn't necessarily better on TikTok either, because with TikTok, you can go what up to three minutes. I think everyone in the world has that capability unlocked now. But really what's still testing well is something that's 30 to 45 seconds and still 7, 10, second, 15 second videos can do really, really well. So don't be too concerned about making something long. And maybe you go, okay, if there's like, I don't know, 20 pieces of trivia that I can give about these white Dexter bowls, then I now have 20 quick little videos that I can put up. And I can do maybe two a day for 10 days because that kind of frequency and consistency TikTok likes, like two or three a day. But again, if it's like a quick tip, a quick trick, a quick technique, a quick little piece of trivia, that's fine. You don't have to do anything very, very complex. Um, and you can start growing an audience better. Uh, my son was doing just one video a day for like a week and he started a TikTok account from scratch and he got to 987 uh, followers on TikTok. Okay. In a very crowded space because he's a Patrick Mahomes fan. Don't hate on me. I don't, you know, I don't love or hate Patrick Mahomes folks. Mike says, sounds great. Yeah, no, that's super easy. It really is. Um, and then you can do other series where you can do tips, tricks, and techniques about your Smithy tips, tricks, techniques, and trivia about the various produce that you have, right? Like you could have like two videos a day, like, you know, series for every single week, you know, you're a farmer and a blacksmith, you've got a ton of stuff that you can create content for on TikTok. Okay, so let's do another like wartime Great Depression success story. And let's see what the takeaways are for this. Procter & Gamble was another company. One of the main things that they did back then was they created soap, right? So, you know, um, they actually came out better um, than they were going into 1929 when everything first really crashed hard, right? So how did they manage to beat the depression? Because some of you have business models that can totally do this too. Um, so what they did was they did not throttle down their content marketing. Okay. They did not do that. Now, back then content marketing looked differently, but I'm going to kind of retrofit this for today. Um, they actually continued with their marketing. They also were looking to find a new way to get out in front of people. So what they did back then, there were no podcasts back then, but they decided to get into commercial radio broadcasts, um, because they felt like no matter what people want and or need soap, they just do. So we're not going to run away and say no one's going to buy or they're all going to like a whole family's going to share our bar soap for a month. They didn't get into like stinking thinking and like, you know, negative thinking. They were just like, you know, they may not be able to afford to do this, that or the other thing, but they're still going to want to spend so that they, they and their loved ones are clean. Um, so what they did was they actually got innovative on top of not dropping their other campaigns. They got into um, radio broadcast, commercial radio broadcast, which was new back then. For you guys, it might be podcast today. Um, and so what they did was they did, <laughs> they sponsored daily radio serials that were aimed at homemakers, which was Procter & Gamble's core market back then. Um, so they debuted their first serial 
Oxydoll's own Ma Perkins, women around the country fell in love with the tales of this kind widow in this fictional story. And of course, it's starring Procter and Gamble. Um, you know, announcements about it, you know, using the product in it, whatever. The program was so successful um, in terms of sales, not just brand recognition, but sales, that Procter and Gamble started to create more shows to get out in front of people more and more often. Um, it, it, to the point where, let's see, if the depression kicked in really in 1929, Within a decade, Procter & Gamble itself was producing 21 radio shows, and they're known as the pioneers of what has come to be called the soap opera. Isn't that fun? But it, they actually made way more money instead of tucking their tail between their legs and running away. Um, Martin Guitars is another example. Um, that You might think that guitars and instruments and stuff, that that's going to be something that's a rough sell in like a down you know, economy, like who's going to spend for the little extras. But as many of my, you know, students, both free and paid know, um, you know, when times hit hard, there's actually a larger swath of people across the globe that are the haves and they spend so much they make up for the have nots, either the pre-existing have nots that never could have bought from you or God help them, anybody else that fell into the have nots because they lost their job or they lost whatever. Um, you know, I don't make light of any of this stuff, but we all have businesses. It's our, you know, moral obligation to help our ideal customer, no matter how good or how bad times are. And you just have to know that even though some people might not be able to afford your goodies um, to your necessities that you sell, there's still a huge market that will. In fact, they do say that the worst, um, the fastest going on a business plan is to sell stuff people don't want. The next fastest business uh, going on a business plan is to sell to people who don't have money. So like, honestly, whether you really, really thought about this or not, you are selling to mostly people who are upper middle class and above or middle class, but they're not living paycheck to paycheck. They're doing okay. They have expendable cash. So, you know, times may get hard and they may squeeze a lot of people, whether it's wartime, the economy because of supply chain issues and continuous increasing um, increases in interest um, and inflation. But you know what? You're still going to have a very big dose of upper middle class and above that are going to still need and want things. And if you go and you put your business in the witness protection program, because you're too scared to sell, you're going to miss out. So what happened was Martin Guitars said, you know what? We're not going to tuck our tail between our legs. We're not just going to shutter our business because you don't need a guitar to survive, right? You might want and or need soap very, very badly, but guitars, come on. Um, and they sold high quality guitars. So they're not selling cheapo guitars. How did they make it? Well, you know, they shifted around their operations to, you know, um, work their businesses more efficiently, cost effectively. They didn't reduce their prices. Um, what they did do was they decided to increase the scope of their offerings so that they weren't just selling instruments, but using the manpower and the supplies that they knew they could continue to get um, cost effectively and using the equipment they already had, what they did was they decided to make everything from um, instrument parts for people who needed repairs that really hadn't been a market that they cared about before that. Um, but they also created wooden jewelry and sold it. True story. Martin Guitars. <laughs> they stuck to their principle of not giving, you know, huge discounts. Um, they stood on their quality and they knew that it wasn't about the quantity of potential ideal customers they could sell to, but the quality of those people. And of course, they did their marketing and made their offerings really focusing on those people and not the everyman. Um, they maintained their relationship with smaller dealers and buyers from wooden jewelry to the repair crowd to, you know what, I've got some spare time. I will buy a violin or a guitar and I will learn how to play now. <laughs> um, they also, let's see, I think that's like the only things that I will really highlight here to move this along. 
Um, but what, so now how does this kind of like affect people who are product space people, handmade or not? Um, so back in like March this time, two years ago in 2020, I did have people who, for example, worked with cloth and fabric who said, I'm going to continue to sell my evergreen signature product line collection because I make sales from that month in, month out. And I'm not going to tuck my tail between my legs, Stacy, just because times really got hard. I'm going to continue to market and sell, sure. But they started to create cloth masks. And I have one student who came to me with a six-figure business. And she launched a second business that, following what I taught her from March, you know, into, oh my God, 2020 wasn't out and she hit six figures with her second business because of masks. And of course, and some of you watching this live or on the replay may include those people. Anybody who was busting out masks for months and months afterwards, that really did help buoy you up. But if you sat there and went, the sky's falling, 20 million Americans alone lost their jobs. I can't sell my purses, my wallets, my organizers you know, my towels, my anything else, who's going to buy right now, you not only wouldn't have had any sales, but you would have lost out on what you could have made a killing with. So just like Martin Guitars, who said, okay, we're going to continue to sell our stuff because we know the haves are still going to keep coming. There's more have nots, bummer. But, you know, then there's people who aren't completely pinched that might have instruments. Well, now we're going to service that repair base crowd. Um, and we can sell to dealerships or individuals and we can have a second stream of income. Uh, and then we'll have a third stream of income by selling jewelry. We've got this stuff. Why not? And they did it. So they actually kept their sales up throughout the depression. They just had to be scrappy and flexible. So depending upon what business model you're in, coach, course creator, digital assets, only otherwise services or products based what can you do with what you have already so that you can continue to sell in tough times? We're going to get to the concept of countries maybe having difficulties with supply chain issues and like just some thoughts that I have as we sit here right now to kind of help you um, with that. But let's go on. Let's see really quickly. Again, I don't want to read the whole article. Okay, so this is another example of the same thing. Um, so the depression was hard enough for most countries, but the nation's brewers had it bad because you also had the prohibition running simultaneously to like war, depression. Now you have the prohibition from 1920 to 1933. So if you were like a bar, you were a brewery, you were screwed unless you did the illegal speakeasies. But anyway, and of course some did do that. I'm not telling you to do anything illegal, but what I'm saying is that, um, there were so many breweries, a lot of them that did not pivot, um, went out of business. Okay. But you had folks that were in breweries. Lisa says, yay, soap. That's what I'm doing. I'm cutting soap while listening. Of course, girl, you're going to be able to sell to people. You are. And if there's supply chain issues and people can't get soap from overseas sources, you can be like, hey, I'm in America, for example, not only made in the USA, but I can get this out to you, right? Hey, Laura, Music Chick Art's here. What's going on, Music Chick Art? Right. So um, actually, Laura, you should definitely listen to this on the replay because I did a story about Martin Guitars and how they made it through by continuing to sell their music-based stuff by going into the repair-based market and then also using their pre-existing materials and equipment and manpower to create wooden jewelry to supplement, supplement their business's income. And they kept up with their sales figures throughout the depression. So the prohibition, you know, really kind of decimated, you know, the alcohol related industry for anybody who was just going to sit there and sit like a sitting duck and go, well, well, this didn't blow over in a couple of weeks. So I guess I'll go under. Um, you know, uh, breweries, for example, diversified. So they were able to do more. So for example, they started running like dairy. They started to help distribute that. They sold meat. They ventured into other various uh, agricultural enterprises. 
Um, they were also able to, by following the law, make what was called near beer that had trace elements and trace amounts of alcohol so that they, again, pivoted. They got very creative and they sold what they could sell during that period of time. Um, there were also breweries that said, you know what? I'll go non-alcoholic completely and sell root beer. I could care less. Um, and so, you know, they managed to get through some very tough times by being scrappy and being flexible. And yes, using a lot of what they already had on hand in terms of equipment. So somebody like Mike can be like, bring it on. If it turns out that nothing, God forbid, or almost nothing can come into the U.S., I'm your blacksmith. I will help you repair. I will help create. I can make jewelry. I can make all sorts of stuff and bring it on. It's time to get fresh produce that's made in the USA and I can ship it directly to you if you can't come to me within a reasonable period of time, right? So think about that if you're Mike and, you know, no matter what your business model is, any of the stories that I told you, any of the advice that I gave you, you could do a whole bunch of things. You could pivot. You could create a supplemental business. There's so many things that you can do. <laughs> she says, oh, okay, I'll watch from the beginning. Thank you. Yay. Okay. So when it comes to my product space, folks, whether you're handmade or not, you really, and, and, and for some of you, the more experienced you are, I'm not telling you necessarily what you, you know, you wouldn't have thought of on your own if you haven't thought of it already, but some people are newer to the industry. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but like 2020, March 2020 was so two years ago. I've had newbie um, entrepreneurs come to me over the last year that weren't as clobbered as when there were lockdowns or when, dep depending upon where you were in the world, you couldn't ship outside your own country. Uh, a lot of people might remember, um, you know, um, Oh, goodness. One of my students was in, um, you know, uh, Scotland, and he couldn't ship outside his country for months and months and months. Um, so we definitely did double backflips to do business within his country. And that kind of helped because there wasn't so much coming in or out. So again, no matter where you are, if you had to pretend that your country was landlocked, what can you liquidate and sell that you already have that people could, you know, use as is? What can you kind of tweak and then say, hey, given tough times, you can use these things. You know, what can you clear and sale or do a double feature on to create packages to get stuff out the door so you can turn your stuff to cash, right? Um, but for my product space, people really look at your materials, the, um, you know, stuff that you need maybe to maintain your equipment. And to the extent that you can do it, um, I would stockpile up, Okay. I would. Would I say right now to go crazy? No. But would I say to back up within a reasonable amount what you have just in case, God forbid, you know, the global market gets kind of crazy. Um, who's landlocked? Who has supply chain issues that can really, really disproportionately affect you? Depending upon who you are and what you're doing with, say, a product-based business, where you are in the world, think about supplies that you can easily get from your local, your regional, your state, territory, or holding wide um, sort of situation. So what can you get? It's as close to a no-brainer as you can. And what equipment, what skills do you have so that you can con continue to crank out products? Let's just say, God forbid, you get to a point where you sell out all or almost everything that you have. Does that make sense? And does anybody have any questions about either this topic or content marketing in general? I'm going to take a quick sip, eat a little bit of cheese really quickly. I don't do too much dairy, but we had some fresh cheese. So, And I'll just wait to see if I have any questions from you guys. If I don't, I can kind of wrap it up. In the meantime, make sure that you check out. It's either going to be live first pinned comment on the replay, it will be the first line in the show notes or the description down below. Check out the Mint Batch of Frosting if you haven't gotten already. It's the marketing and sales plans that I would recommend that you do in the month of March so that by relationship marketing, you can build up your brand-based community. 
and your email list where really about three quarters of your sales should come from, from month to month, and that you can also build up your social media standing. But of course, most importantly, how you can get sales long after St. Patrick's Day is over or St. Patrick's Day means nothing to your ideal customers. That's okay. There's plenty of other ways to meet people with both relationship marketing and sales-based marketing to get sales from them, especially in the month of March. Mm. So I don't mean to eat all over you guys, but let me know if you have any questions about today's content or content marketing in general. Mm. Really, really quickly. Mm -mm -mm. Um, if you've not seen the last or the most recent videos on my channel, I'm going to finish out the, let me see. Okay. I'm going to finish out the coach course creator series that I had going on. If you're not a coach or a course creator, you don't think that that's going to be one way that you can supplement your income, which by the way, you could consider if you're just straight up services, product space, digital product space, you could consider becoming a coach or a course creator to show other people how to DIY. Um, especially if they want to end up laying low at home, they kind of want to, you know, keep, keep a little bit chill and do their own stuff. You know what? you could totally sell a quick and easy little course to show people how to do it um, themselves. And that might be something to consider if things get crazy over the next couple of weeks or months where, you know what, digital is awesome because you don't run out of supplies. You don't have supply chain issues. Um, you could work the influencer circuit, like look at Lenora Love. She's going through her, um, you know, her... Um, She's going to start her 365 day, a video a day, every single day on YouTube, her orbit to grow her channel, to grow her reach, to get channel authority for like one, two topics that she's picked so that her channel ranks higher and higher. So she could be making, um, you know, if you grow your YouTube channel and you qualify for and you're accepted into the partner program, you could get um, AdSense revenue which I know if you're like, say, a product-based business, like my coaches and course creators are like, of course, or, oh, that makes sense. And now I'll really double down on growing my YouTube channel. Um, but there are other people who are like more product-based businesses and they're going, well, I, I mean, I could see maybe if I really had to, to do a quick little course on how to do what I do, how to make your own jewelry. So if you're not going to buy from me, at least if you're not going to buy my jewelry, and you're a hardcore DIYer, I could still make money from you by showing you how to do what I do, right? Um, and if you're like, oh no, then I'll create all these competitors. I hate to tell you, lots of people are entrepreneurs, but they don't end up implementing at all or much. And then they're never really truly entrepreneurs. <laughs> That's why when I have people coming to me saying, but I really want to be a blogger, you know, but there's like, you know, Neil Patel says there's like two, what, what's the amount? 2 million blogs out there, you know, and I really like Neil Patel. Um, and he's probably right. But here's the thing, like, just because there's 2 million blogs out there, how many haven't been touched after the first 30, 60, 90 days of blogging, and the blogger wasn't suddenly rich, right? You're going to outlast most of your competitors if you're at all serious. So I could care less how many competitors I have. I can outwork them all day long. <laughs> can you? If you really love what you do and you really love who you do it for, you can too. Uh, Mallory says, ha, ah, entrepreneurs, I'm guilty. You're not guilty. Listen, knowing is half the battle, Mallory, right? So like you know that you're more of a entrepreneur than an entrepreneur. Implementation every single day can help you on the, you know, uh, by, you know, shedding your entrepreneur skin, like, you know, a snake, a very pretty snake. And, you know, you're, you're becoming the next best version of yourself. You're going to jettison what didn't work to make things work. By the way, if you guys are watching me live or on the replay, please give this video a big thumbs up. I could care less for my ego. What happens is while I'm live, <laughs> it's more likely the algorithms to push out this video to ping people 
so that they can catch it while it's live too. And on the replay, it's more likely to show the replay to my subscribers who, again, I have students all across the world that everyone's going to be able to watch at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time live, right? So for every thumbs up I can get, I treat it like it's a tip in my tip jar. But seriously, even if you're a products-based business, you're going to want to have your own YouTube channel or become a TikTok influencer or really work reels so that you can reinvigorate your Instagram account, right? Because reels is going to give you the kind of reach that you would have gotten with like feed posts, you know, your more standard feed posts, were they photos, were they graphics, it didn't matter. Um, you can get the kind of reach and the kind of like push out onto the explore page via suggested um, like you would have seven years ago with feed posts alone. Reels is going to do that for you today. I will say I put a poll out on my channel. I know that I have a lot of people who are between 40 to 70 years old, I kid you not, watching my channel. Because, you know, I'm here for the established business owners who are coming to the table in terms of content marketing. I can help everybody. I've got students in their 20s and 30s too. But, you know, I have three students who are 78 years old apiece. I kid you not. Um, it's never too late. I did have somebody say, I'm 65. Is it too late? for me to become an entrepreneur, I really want to be. And I'm like, um, the average life expectancy is to at least 83 years old. So you've got close to 20 years, God willing, maybe even more to be here on this earth with us. What are you going to do for the next 20 years? Not be an entrepreneur if that's what you want. Oh, I never thought of it that way before. I've been, I've been a coach for over eight years now. Uh, I, I've heard, I want to say I've heard it all. And I know I haven't heard it all because that's a little bit ambitious, but I've heard an awful lot. Um, so Mallory, it's up to you, man. Um, you know, content marketing with one, two, three TikToks a day that are just mere seconds long can help to blow you up on TikTok. Will you have that same opportunity a year from now? I highly doubt it as more people become content creators and not just content consumers. TikTok as of right now has almost 53% adults. Um, when I mean adults, I mean more than just 21 year old, like there are a lot of like millennials, older millennials or geriatric millennials, as some people call them, um, Gen X and baby boomers. OK, so it's not too late to get into TikTok um, and TikTok's going to blow you up, period. Reels, they're desperate. So they're going to give you all sorts of reach that maybe you don't even technically deserve to keep you so titillated that you'll stay on Instagram so that it doesn't become my space compared to TikTok. For millennials, millennials are spending more time on TikTok now than YouTube, which is ridiculous. Nobody thought TikTok was going to take on YouTube for any of the demographics anytime soon, but they are. So when I get adults who are 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who cry to me and say TikTok's for kids, nope, since last summer it was 52%. Last summer? Oh, late last summer because it was August. I kid you not. So the amount of adults are only increasing and any topic that your ideal customer would have a main pain point or a main passion point in, if you went to TikTok, and you searched on that in terms of keywords or hashtags, you're going to see that things have millions to billions of views on them already. So if you really are like, I don't have money for ads, and now times are so uncertain, and I really don't know how to do effective content marketing. Yeah, earlier when I was talking about the soap opera with Procter & Gamble, they got into commercial radio content. Today's version of that is a podcast. Now, depending upon your ideal customer, a podcast specifically might make sense. But in lieu of that, like so many people are watching short form video content right now. That's why Instagram is going to give you reach like you would have had seven years ago for a feed post. They're going to give you that for Instagram reels for the foreseeable future. TikTok's going to be very viable for the foreseeable future. Would I say more than a year out? Again, I think over time, more people are going to become content creators and not just be simply satisfied to be content consumers. So if you're crying saying, oh, it's too late for me on Instagram, no, it's not if you do reels. Um, if you want to jump on TikTok and get almost a thousand followers in a week like my son did, and all he did was do a video a day, my goodness, <laughs> 
And he didn't even hashtag his face off. He did do some smart optimization, though, because, you know, he gets it from yours truly. Does anybody have any other questions or are you all in a good place right now, my students? But make sure I have a coach series or two or three on here now. Even if you're not a coach or a course creator, like there's great marketing tips and or branding tips that if you stripped away the words coach, course creator, it would still benefit you too. So if you're my product space people and you're like, Stacy hasn't put out anything that I'm interested in right now. No, 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 no. Go watch those videos. And you're going to get a lot of advice that you can extract out for yourself. And if you have any questions about how you can apply the advice that's in that video, because it's not obvious to you, then put the put the question in the comments below that video and I will help you out. It's not a problem. Uh, hey, Donna, what's going on? We're just wrapping up now. Hello, Transformational Healing by Donna. Miss Donna. And I did the whole thing about I don't have a crystal ball. And then Donna and her husband brought me one. <laughs> I still I still love it and refer to it all the time. So thank you. So, you know, does what I say make sense, Mallory? Hopefully it does. Let's see. Okay, so I just gave you a couple of examples that got decimated by the Great Depression, by World War II. <laughs> uh, and in the case of the breweries, you know, if that wasn't enough, then they got the triple threat of the prohibition for a number of, number of years. And when they were willing to pivot, when they were willing to use the equipment and the manpower and the materials that they had, um, you know, to create new or related or supplementary streams of income, Lots of businesses did just fine. Under no circumstances did any of those businesses that I mentioned not do their content marketing in, anymore. They continued to do it. Um, in fact, with Procter & Gamble, they literally invented the soap opera and went into an additional area and had to pay to put out additional content and get additional paid reach for you guys with little to no expense at all, you could do a podcast if that makes sense to your ideal customer. You have to re research your ideal customer to understand if a podcast specifically makes sense. But in lieu of that, TikToks or Reels can really save your bacon right now because you will get an unbelievable amount of reach. Look what's going on with Mike Reinhard. 200,000 views. Um, you know, and I just gave him an idea for two videos a day for like 10 days. Um, it's not that hard. You have to be flexible. You can't just run away because hard times are here again. It may not be a pandemic. It could be war. It could be supply chain issues. It could be rising costs, right? Under no circumstances do you cut your prices across the board. That's, that's a going out of business plan too, because if you don't have enough uh, profit margin, you can't stay. You can't stay. So, you know, for my coaches and course creators, you wouldn't necessarily be doing sales anyway. But for my products-based people, yes, do sales. But like Renee Christine says, price high enough, given the facts and circumstances, your costs and everything, so you can discount low enough. Um, I will stand behind sales, but I'm not going to stand behind. Suddenly, I'm going to drop my prices on everything. Way to go, Mike. Congrats, says Amy. Okay, you guys, if everybody's in a good place, make sure that you check out the Mint Batch of Frost. And if you haven't already, I'm going to put that on the replay for my replay people. I am going to put that in the description. It'll be the first line in the description will be the link. Um, and I will talk to you guys. Oh, I will be relaunching Social Gram Shortcut. I'm in the background redoing um, a lot of the content that's in there. Most of the content is evergreen and or good intel soon. I'm adding um, content about Instagram Reels specifically. Um, in the Facebook group, there were a lot of posts and challenges and stuff. My pre-existing students are fine, but for new students, and I'm sure my pre-existing students would appreciate it, we're going to have reels baked in. We're going to update some stuff that needs updating, but a lot of the content marketing uh, basics, I'm telling you right now, those are still good. So, But I just want to freshen stuff up. If you're a pre-existing student, if you've been wanting to get in, Mike, was that you? You were one of the people who wanted to get in. If you want to get into Social Gram Shortcut, make sure you go to don'tbeafakeguru.com, opt in there. 
If you're not on my email list already, you'll get a cool freebie, like 10 ways not to come across as like a hobbyist or a fake guru um, and how to be trustworthy instead. Um, go to don't be a fake guru.com. Um, get on the email list if you're not. And I will be emailing my list in the next week or so. Once everything's completely updated and swapped out on social gram shortcut, and I will do another launch of social gram. Oh yeah. Well, you know, there's nothing sad about it though, Donna, just as sadly prices for much of my things may have to go up as I restock. Like I said earlier, I know you just came in now. You got to do what you got to do. Um, inflation is causing everything to go up. Anyway, you have to protect your profit margins. Dawn is an advanced student of mine, so I know she knows that. But for the benefit of anybody else who's new or relatively new to me, you've got to protect your profit margins. If you can't walk away with a third of the cost, this is a quick and dirty. But if you can't walk away with a third of the cost being bad, I'm sorry, a third of the price being more pure profit to you, you need to raise your prices anyway. So um, you know what? Just let everyone know, Donna, if there's anything hanging around in your um, any of the um, shops that you have or the sites that you work, because Donna has a few, let people know for the product space stuff, you have until X date to make a purchase because everything has to go up as of X day. So that's kind of like running a sale, right? It is running a sale without running a sale, right? You don't have to have coupons. It's just like, come and get it before I have to raise that price. Um, and then, of course, for everything new, you're going to have to raise your prices. It's hard. Joe's Dairy Bar and Grill has had to raise their prices four times over the last year, and we're going to have to continue to do it. Um, you know, most of the people in our neighborhood understand for people on fixed incomes, that's hard. Um, but there's nothing we can do because, as many of you know, Joe's Dairy Bar and Grill actually made a ton more money when they stopped trying to be the cheapest deal in town and just had over-the-top food for over-the-top memories, which became our slogan. And our prices, we price amongst the highest uh, in the county that we're in and amongst the highest for the Hudson Valley region. And instead of getting fewer sales, we've gotten more. We went from barely profitable in 2015 to seven figures by about 2018. And we've only beat our previous year every single year, you know, and I'm pretty sure we're going to do it again. So I'm going to talk to you guys later. All right. Bye.